small pronounced. There are negative impacts for wheat, rice, and maize production in some regions for local temperature increases of 2 degrees Celsius. And in fact, this decrease in yields is already occurring, even with the temperature increases that we have today. So there would be impacts on livelihoods and poverty, slowing down on economic growth. And this can happen in a variety of ways. Uh, for instance, if there's going to be an adverse impact on agriculture that affects the lives and livelihoods of a large number of people across the globe, extreme events can have a major impact. Um, some of you might remember that in 2003 there was a, a very serious and severe heat wave in Europe, as a result of which a large number of people died. When you had extreme precipitation events, there's a major economic implication. <clears throat> you saw that with Superstorm Sandy. You saw that with the floods in the UK this year. And if you go back in time two years ago, roughly, you had this massive flood in Thailand. And the impact of that was not only confined to Thailand and Bangkok, but even to Japan. Because uh, uh, companies like Toyota source a lot of their automobile equipment automobile parts from uh, Bangkok and when the factories over there shut down because of the flood that had a direct impact on production in the major automobile manufacturers in, in Japan. So you know in an um, integrated, in an interconnected world, anything that happens in one part of the globe has implications for other regions as well. And this is something that is economically important but it also has various other dimensions, both ecological and human. Now therefore, what we really need to do is to develop climate resilient pathways. And I'm very happy to see that the Patel College is working on some of these issues uh, that combine adaptation and mitigation to reduce climate change and its impact. Because since mitigation reduces the time and magnitude of warming, it also increases the time available for adaptation to a particular level of climate change, potentially by several decades. So therefore, you really need a combination of mitigation and adaptation. Adaptation alone will not work, because we'll reach certain thresholds and certain tipping, tipping points beyond which adapting further would become extremely challenging. And similarly, mitigation will not work by itself, simply because there's a certain inertia in the system as a result of which climate change will continue for several decades, even if you had very stringent mitigation actions taken in hand immediately. So you need a combination of both to create the kind of resilience that societies have to develop. Now in baseline scenarios, without additional mitigation effort, direct CO2 emissions from the energy supply sector are expected to almost double or even triple by 2050 compared to 2010. And I want to tell you that today, I mean in 2010, we had emissions of greenhouse gases at the level of 49 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. And nine, 10 gigatons was the increase that took place between 2000 and 2010. So roughly an increase of one gigaton of CO2 equivalent each year. And therefore, to be able to deal with this, is, this serious problem, uh, you have to take in hand major mitigation efforts. Otherwise, we could get doubling or even tripling uh, of, uh, in, of uh, emissions from energy supply, CO2 emissions from energy supply by the middle of this century. And this results in significant increases in indirect emission from electricity use in the building <coughs> and industry sectors. See, this is, in a sense, um, a kind of a vicious circle. When you have high temperatures, then you also need <coughs> high air conditioning. And you must remember there are parts of the world where incomes are increasing. People have not had air conditioning at all in the past. With higher incomes and with the higher temperatures, they would obviously be installing much more air conditioning than we have today. And infrastructure developments and long-lived products that lock societies into GHG intensive emission pathways may be difficult or very costly to change. And this is true of buildings in particular. 
if we construct, if we design and construct buildings which are locked into a high level of energy intensity, it's very difficult to change them. Buildings have an economic life, which is not like going and changing your washing machine or your or motor car. You, you really are stuck with buildings. Um, a politician who is not entirely a great favorite of mine, uh, Winston Churchill, a great man, no doubt, once said that we shape buildings and then buildings shape us. And that's a fact. Because we have the opportunity to shape buildings in such a way that indirectly they would also shape the way we use energy and other resources. And uh, this is something that we need to put in place in terms of policy, in terms of regulation, benchmarks, standards that are laid down. You know, you see that in the case of automobile uh, fuel efficiency standards, but you really need to apply these across the board. And while buildings in some places are being made far more efficient than in the past, there's a huge amount of potential which is yet to be exploited. Um, now, <clears throat> if we have to reach uh, uh, levels of 450 parts per million of CO2 equivalent by 2100, which is what we need to keep temperature increase below 2 degrees Celsius uh, relative to pre-industrial level, then we need uh, to lower global greenhouse gas emissions in 2050 <coughs> than in 2100. So it will be about 40 to 70 percent lower globally. And emission levels near zero gigatons of CO2 equivalent or below in 2100. So basically, in order to limit temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius or below, you would have to enter a zone of negative emissions before the end of this century. Now it can be done, but it will take a lot of hard work. It will take an enormous global effort to bring this about. And you need more rapid improvements in energy efficiency, uh, an almost uh, trebling or quadrupling of the share of zero and low carbon energy supply from renewables by 2050. So we have this window of opportunity of, you know, within this 36 year period of bringing about a rapid shift in energy supply by which we move to low or zero carbon energy sources. Uh, and nuclear energy, biomass, fossil energy with CCS, carbon capture and storage, and bioeconomic, bioenergy and CCS by the year 2050 are the options that are available to us. And I think each society will have to decide what it wants to adopt. Now, we have a number of scenarios of different uh, levels that would be reached by 2100. Uh, and this will require efforts to reduce um, deforestation, major afforestation efforts, and deployment of bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. But of course, the availability and scale of these and other reduction technologies uh, are uncertain and associated with challenges and risks. So if we want a certain outcome, say by the middle of this century, and then of course by the end of this century, we need to put in place policies and measures today by which the market gets signals, consumers get signals, and we start moving in the right direction. So really speaking, what we have assessed in these pathways by which mitigation can take place clearly indicate that action has to be taken urgently and adequately today. <coughs> now, fortunately, there are a whole range of uh, co-benefits. <coughs> mitigation scenarios reaching around 450 ppm CO2 equivalent concentrations by 2100 show large-scale global changes in the energy supply sector. There will be systemic and cross-sectional mitigation strategies which would be needed because these are most cost-effective. Cost you can't just focus on specific <coughs> sectors. You really need something wider across the entire economy. And at the energy system level, these include reductions in GHG emissions intensity in the energy supply sector, a switch to low carbon energy carriers, and reductions in energy demand in the end use sectors without compromising what are the end use sectors? State transport, buildings, industry, of course. 
And most importantly, we also need to build a lot of changes in lifestyle. That again is an important mitigation option that the world has to consider. We need to reduce energy demand. Um, we need to provide more flexibility for carbon intensity reduction in the energy supply sector, hedge against related supply side risks, avoid lock into carbon intensive infrastructure. Um, because once you've established infrastructure for a certain set of technologies and practices, uh, to change them becomes very difficult. Just to give you an example, if, let's say you want to go in for um, electric vehicles. You would have to set up the infrastructure by which these can be charged in a manner that doesn't disrupt your day-to-day -day transportation systems. Uh, but once you've set up that kind of infrastructure, you've reduced the options by which you can use something else. So this is true of, let's say, the, uh, the competition between road and rail traffic. Uh, if you've set up highways, you've set up automobile manufacture, and an, and an entire infrastructure, which is based on the use of private automobiles or automobiles for any kind of purpose, then to change that becomes very difficult because it's also politically much more difficult. On the other hand, you know, I give the example of the city of Zurich, which is an excellent public transport. You get off at the airport. You don't need to step into a car at all. Uh, because public transport takes you everywhere, every corner of the city, and almost every hour of the day or night. So, you know, therefore you have an infrastructure, uh, and at the same time you've got some very heavy taxes on the ownership and registration of cars, uh, by which people make very rational choices. They don't need cars. They just use public transport. And if you need a car, you rent it and go out on the weekend, it's much cheaper to do that than to, than to keep uh, a car at home. Um, if you have a supply system by which you can get milk in the supermarket, you're not going to keep a cow in your garage. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, these are things that uh, obviously we have to do consciously when you establish infrastructure. Then um, there are huge co-benefits. Um, um, what we really need to focus on is renewable nuclear CCS. And our projections show that these will increase from about 30% today to more than 80% by 2050. Now, every country, every society will have to exercise rational choices. Fossil fuel power generation without CCS will be put, phased out almost entirely by 2100. Now, with CCS, yes, if you can uh, employ carbon capture and storage, then you can use fossil fuels for power generation. And renewable energy technologies will be deployed at significant scale. Nuclear could make an increase in contribution. And replacement of current world average coal fired power plants with modern, highly efficient natural gas combined cells to power plants for combined heat power plants. So these are some of the elements of the scenarios by which we'll be able to bring about mitigation in the future. Um, and I won't go into this, you know, these are just some uh, characteristics of CCS and bioenergy plus CCS, BE CCS. Um, the good news is that the cost of bringing about this kind of mitigation is not going to be very high. For instance, in 2030, the loss in global consumption would be about 1.7% of the global GDP. In 2050, it will be 3.4%, and in 2100, 4.8%. Now, if you consider this, if you consider these figures, then really, this is not a very high price to pay for avoiding and doing away with some of the worst impacts of climate change. So I think we need to take a rational view of climate policies by which we adapt and make sure that we minimize the impact of climate change by mitigation. So the costs over here are clearly not uh, difficult or daunting. Um, and these are some of the co-benefits, uh, improved energy efficiency and energy security, cleaner energy sources, air quality and human health, 
will be far better. Reduced energy and water consumption in urban areas, sustainable agriculture and forestry, protection of ecosystems for carbon storage. So if you carry out effective mitigation, there's a whole host of co-benefits which are listed <coughs> over here that also make it far more attractive to pursue this part. And finally, Gandhi said two important things. He said the technological society has two choices. First, it can wait until catastrophic, catastrophic failures expose systemic deficiencies, distortions, and self-deception. Secondly, a culture can provide social checks and balances to correct for systemic distortions prior to catastrophic failures. So this goes back to what I showed initially uh, and what Einstein said. Problems cannot be solved at the level of awareness, of awareness that created them. Now that we have awareness, we have knowledge, we certainly don't have to live through catastrophes. We need to anticipate them and act in a way that we avoid them. And you know, the world is so focused on GDP growth, on consuming and producing more and more. Uh, but clearly uh, speaking, we are imposing a lot of externalities, both on human systems as well as ecosystems. And therefore, what we need is a better method by which we assess and measure human progress. And if we don't do that, then I think what Gandhi said is right. Speed is irrelevant if you're going in the wrong direction. And if we're going in the wrong direction, there's no point in saying we are growing at X percentage a year in terms of GDP. Well, if that's going to impose a huge lot of externalities which are negative, then clearly you are going in the wrong direction and to sort of beat your chest and say we're doing very well is totally irrelevant. So I'll stop here and I'll be very happy to take any questions.